Hello, friends. This is Jen Spencer here to talk to you about Form 3's books for the 2022-23 Alvieri school year. So Form 3 uh, consists of 7th and 8th grade. And, um, and what we're doing this year is uh, it's new. Um, I hope you like this feature. Basically, I have spread out in front of me all the books, I think, <laughs> for seventh and eighth grade, or at least most of them. And I'm going to go through them with you. Just um, if you're new, you can see what kind of books attract us uh, to see if it's a good fit for your family. If you're not new, then you can see what books are new <laughs> uh, and, and get a little bit of a preview. We'll talk to you a bit about. Um, why certain books were chosen, maybe how certain books support other books or other parts of the curriculum, so that if you choose to make a substitution, you have all the information that went into choosing these particular books. So we'll start with Bible. So kids in grades seven and eight actually work with the ninth graders on Bible. Um, if you have mostly younger kids, it's perfectly fine to combine your middle school kids with your younger kids. And you guys can just do the Patterson Smith books with grades two through six, or uh, you can work with the ninth graders. The ninth graders do a little bit more in Bible than the seventh and eighth graders do. So just as a heads up this year, um, you're going to need to choose one of our Sunday reading titles from the bookshelf uh, to slot into one of your scheduled Bible times. The other days, um, you guys are going to be reading from a study Bible. This comes in several different translations. So if NIV is not for you, that's fine. But, um, but what this has uh, is different I mean it's the art it's the architecture it's the excavations the archaeology the history that we know um just really to treat bible as a an academic study it's not simply uh, a devotional time it it really is you know wanting to bring the history of scripture to life Bible is typically read with the stories in chronological order, and so this is a good tool to have. It tells you about the different epochs in, in the Bible and um, sort of what you can expect from them, how they're organized, and, uh, and things like that. And also some maps and artifacts and things in here, too. And then um, their Bible atlas is pretty robust. Uh, with lots of different charts and um, lots to correlate with your geography studies as well. So that is um, Bible. We moved the savior of the world up to just be high school. Uh, so your seventh and eighth graders won't be reading savior of the world this year, but they will start that back up. Uh, when they get into ninth grade. Um, so the next on the list is citizenship. For Plutarch this year, we're going to start with the life of Julius Caesar. It correlates with our ancient history rotation. Um, and we'll read that in terms one and two, and then in term three, we'll read the Shakespeare play that's based on the Plutarch's life. So that is scheduled in there by design, even though Julius Caesar would fit in the first term uh, chronologically, we've got Plutarch there. So we wanted to, we wanted the kids to have a chance to finish Plutarch before they read the Shakespeare play. Um, so that is our plan for Plutarch. Um, and then for government, uh, Lisa Ripperton updated this book. It's not just a reprint. It has 
current information in it, um, which is important to us. But um, this year, they're going to be studying how our government is organized. So starting with the town uh, or village and moving uh, gradually moving out. So your city, your county, your state government, your national government, and then it breaks down um, the branches of the national government. So, um, so that is the topic of conversation for this year for government. Um, Canadians are also studying government using obviously a different resource. Also part of citizenship is um, the book Ourselves. Seventh, eighth and ninth graders read book one and 10th and 11th graders read book two. Um, this is the only book in the homeschooling series that um, Mason wrote to children. And it really, um, I like to say, you know, she says that children are born persons. And this is the book where she really defines that term. What is a person and what characteristics do all people have in common? Um, and, and what do we need in order to flourish? And where are some common pitfalls that if we, um, if we don't, if we aren't, um, careful we can fall into. So um, if you've never read this book, I would highly recommend it. It's a life-changing book. And I think it's one that your kids will look back on um, for the rest of their lives, honestly. Uh, all right, so moving down to English, we made a change last year in our grammar program. We started using Michael Clay Thompson's grammar program, and I really like it. Now, you might find that you get some pushback from your kids on it because when you open it up, um, there's really big print, there's pictures, and um, it looks young but the ideas are not young. The ideas, um, this is honestly the only grammar book that I've ever seen that focuses so much on ideas. And so it's, it's almost like, yeah, this is exactly what we've been waiting for. Um, the look is quirky, <laughs> a little unorthodox, but I'm going to ask you to give this a shot, honestly, because, um, to me, the looks are deceiving. It looks deceivingly simple. Simple. It's not. Um, and if you look at the Michael Clay Thompson website or the the description of this on Fireworks Press, then um, you'll see that the design was by Michael Clay Thompson as well, and he had reasons for designing it this way. So if you're interested, you can look at that. Uh, this does come with a practice book where they do parse the sentences, but it's this isn't all memorization of parts of speech and things like that. It really is idea driven. And he does a really good job integrating with uh, composition, grammar with composition. Um, if if you don't already know this, even though Mason says in one of her volumes that she doesn't teach composition, I believe it's in home education where she says that, but that was written for kids under nine. So um, I guess that's a good way to explain it. In the programs that she used, the, the grammar books had composition lessons in them. And so this is not a departure from what Mason was doing, actually teaching writing. So the first one in this series, it, it focuses on sentences and what makes a good sentence. And then they um, move up to paragraphs. The grammar is integrated with it. It's great, it's great. Um, and then when they get a little bit older, um, they will study essays, not format writing, but really, um, what it means to write well on a topic and to say what you need to say about it. It's not the same as, you know, a five paragraph essay book. Um, these are an animal unto themselves. 
Uh, okay. So another part of English is analyzing and writing poetry. So they start this um, actually in form two. This book is covered over the course of four years. So it's really bite-sized pieces. Um, part of it is about writing poetry, but a lot of it will help you appreciate poetry. Like what is it that a poet is doing and why, why are poems structured the way they're structured? And um, why would anybody write in poetry rather than in, pro in prose? So again, this is an idea heavy um, book about poetry. We um, apply what we learn in here by looking at our poetry books and finding examples of certain things. Um, and then they also write a good bit of poetry in that course as well. Um, our poetry anthology that we have for grades one through eight, uh, this is just a really good children's poetry anthology. And it, it is structured around topics like play and family uh, and nature. And um, so some of the poetry analysis will come from poems in here. This year we added the Gladiola Garden um, as a book of nature poems as well, just for daily poetry reading and enjoyment. Um, and there's a recitation piece that comes from that this year as well. Um, for geography, I wish you guys could see <laughs> stacks and stacks of books around me. For geography, um, sometimes just just to give you a heads up, when when the kids are in first grade, geography is all about. Um, well, there's some basic geography concepts, but a lot of their geography is about different places, cultures, like people who live in other places. Then in second and third grade, they do um, geography concepts again through a book called Cross Country, which is American in focus. Um, in form two, they move to world geography and then in form three they come back to state geography. I think ideally those would be switched. They would do their country before the world. So people ask us sometimes why why didn't you keep you know starting small and working your way out? Um, and it's because we're at the mercy of the books that we have available to us. So we found a really good book for world geography that the reading level was for form two and so we switched and put um, the 50 states in form three uh, this is this is the book that we use um, it's i'm not thrilled with it if i'm honest i'm always looking for a better book on united states history uh, uh, sorry geography but um, our lesson plan writers are really gifted with taking okay books and doing great things with them. <laughs> and so um, in the lesson plans for this book, you will find all kinds of things, um, models that they can build and um, different kinds of research that they can do about states, the state that they live in and the states that are near them. This book isn't read cover to cover. Um, so it's a it's a ref it's used as a reference when we find something better this one will get replaced but right now this is where we are um so next is history so with our history this year the we are we're covering 1800 to 1900 in history which is a rich part of our history, a hard part of our history, but there are so many great books, um, not necessarily history spines, but uh, but a lot of really good biographies, a really, really good historical fiction, really good picture books even. Um, and I am not shy about using a picture book with a middle schooler. Um, they, they can serve a purpose. So 
For our spine this year, we're using the History for Peter books. Um, Gerald Johnson, the reason we like Gerald Johnson, even if some of his comments might be a little outdated, maybe a little out, a little inching up towards the politically incorrect. I, I mean, I've seen such worse cases of <laughs> political incorrectness, but he uh, was writing in the 1960s. He, this isn't a book from today, so we have to be careful not to put our uh, our morals on on somebody else. But uh, but anyway, the reason why we love these books is that he's so good with his ideas. Um, the narrative is good, and you know, for the 1960s, I think he he treats everybody pretty respectfully. Um, but the ideas that he brings out, I, there's nothing else out there that does what these books do. Um, but with that said, we are supplementing these books because there's just not enough meat, uh, not enough of the actual history in them. And so we're supplementing the, those with two books. One of them is this Lincoln photobiography. This is where most of our Civil War history is going to come from. Um, the photo the photo part of the photobiography is really interesting because photography was a new medium at that time. And so um, this war was captured in a way that no previous war had ever been captured. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, um, so this, this does dual duty. It's a, it's a good biography of Abraham Lincoln and also a really good Civil War history book. So we'll supplement with that. And then the other book we're supplementing with is Up From Slavery, um, which I uh, loaned to my dad and he hasn't given it back yet, so I can't show it to you. But it's the biography of um, Booker T. Washington. And uh, I really, really loved not only his, not only was his story fascinating, but his outlook on life was so good. Like there's just there's so much about living that we can glean from that book. And so I'm excited for our middle schoolers to get to read that one this year. Um, then. We also supplement a little with a book that is in my pile in the floor <laughs> somewhere. It's called Heart and Soul. Here it is. Here it is. So um, I think it's really important, especially during the time period we're studying, um, the history that we've gotten that we got when we were in school and that has been emphasized so far in American history has been from um, the white person's perspective. And so this is a really good book to introduce American history from the black person's perspective. Um, I love the tone of this book. It's like you're, you're being gathered up into a grandmother's lap and told a story. And it's hard truths in here, but they are truths and they're they're told well, and they're told um, without anger, or, you know, I just, I think it's a really good tone, but, um, but it does challenge some assumptions from American history books in the past. We just read little bits of this each year. Um, there's just a couple chapters from it that are appropriate for um, for 1800 to 1900, but, but I love this voice, having this voice in our history. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So for world history this year, again, it's correlated 1800 to 1900. Um, so the spine that we chose for that one for this year's story of the world, we don't always use those, but it's it's good for um, for this time period. For ancient history, 
we will be studying the Roman times. And this is a, a series that I just found um, last year, I believe, was the first year we used this. Um, and it's, it's really well written. Um, the ancient history in particular uh, is, is really good, I think, for Charlotte Mason education. Um, Catholic families may enjoy the rest of the series. Um, we probably won't use those because once it, it is published by a Catholic company and uh, once we get to the Reformation, I think it would, it might be too controversial, but the ancient um, is, is really good for everybody. So um, yeah, there's that one. And then they'll also be reading the the Aenid for boys and girls, which picks up after the Trojan War, which they read about last year, and um, and keeps going from there with the, the founding of Rome and all of that. So let's see. They will continue with Sloyd in in handicrafts this year. They're working on felting. They're working on string art and they are working on clay modeling. Um, they will also continue learning how to type, which in our day and age is really an important skill. And um, they move from learning how to sew in the younger grades to learning the art of lettering in middle school. So we've got three levels of lettering. It starts with chalk and it goes over all different kinds of um, letters and flourishes and embellishments and things like that. Uh, but then they do it all in chalk, but then our instructor is also this year going to do some videos with the same kinds of strokes and letters, but with a different medium. So she's going to do some with watercolor and she's going to do some with pen and ink. So that one's going to be fun. Um, I think your kids are going to really like that. <clears throat> uh, so in middle school, they do what's called historical poetry, which means two things. One is poetry that was written during the time period. And so they will be doing some poet studies. They're doing Tennyson and Keats this year. And then there's also historical poetry that was written later, but it was written about something that happened during the time period. And so um, they're going to be reading a book uh, called Carver, A Life in Poems, that is a biography of George Washington Carver. And we we count that as historical poetry. Um, we'll also be pulling out some pieces from their anthologies that were written during this time period or about the time period um, for their historical poetry. Let's see, for literature this year, we like to include historical fiction as one of our genres. And so, um, we have Across Five Aprils, which is a story of um, a family that is torn apart during the Civil War. They have relatives that are, that are on opposite sides. And um, it's just about how hard it is. Um, you know, war can be glorified, um, but living through it is hard, you know, it affects people on a very personal level. So this, this book does a good job of showcasing that. Another historical uh, fiction that I could not put my hands on for some reason is called The Story of the Amistad. That was a slave ship that was um, commandeered by the slaves um, that were being taken to the new world to be sold. They actually took over the ship and um, tried to get back to Africa and couldn't find their way back to Africa. So they ended up in New York. This is a true story. Uh, they ended up in New York and they were, they were on trial. Then at that point, um, the courts were trying to figure out, are these free people 
or are they slaves? Um, and so it's it's a really good book that I feel like there's there's a lot of dignity, um, really really seeing slaves not as a a big group of like people, but um, people who were from different parts of the continent, they didn't speak the same languages, they didn't have the same customs and um, and they were seen as, as not fully human. But in this story, you really, um, the author does a really good job of humanizing everybody. Like everybody's got a family that they miss back home. And, uh, you know, it just, I, I feel like it's really um, an important perspective that people need to get. And then the third historical fiction that we're going to be reading is Thunder Rolling in the Mountain, which is about the Neperse, I think I'm saying that right, Indians, or Native Americans that were um, removed from their homeland. Um, Chief Joseph, I believe, is, is who this one is about. Yeah, Chief Joseph. So it's the story of his tribe. <coughs> We also like to include literature from the time period because I like to give voice to the people who were living in that time period. And so um, a few that we felt like would be good to expose kids to um, is George MacDonald. Um, we're going to do At the Back of the North Wind. And I know that this is sometimes slated with younger kids, but I've used it with fifth graders and even fifth graders had a bit of a hard time understanding the story. Um, once we got to the end of it, they loved it, uh, but I think it, it fits just fine in middle school. So, so we'll be doing that one. We'll also be doing um, Around the World in 80 Days, Jules Verne. Now, this book definitely has that tone of imperialism and empiricism where, oh, we believe in science and it's very stiff and stuffy and uh, and we're, we're going through all these countries and, uh, you know, I don't want to say looking down our noses at the people that live there, but it is a mindset. I mean, that was, that's true. And it was written during the time period. And so I feel like um, he, his voice, we need to know how people thought um, during that time period. And so um, this is just a really fun, fun book, um, almost like a mystery story by the time you get to the end of it i think the kids are really going to love it but be prepared that there's going to be some outdated uh notions in here but when you can say that's the time we're talking about i think that that's that's one place where that becomes appropriate um the third book that is historical fiction written or a novel sorry written during the time period is my absolute favorite ever in the world little women i love this book now we're only uh we're only scheduled to read the first half of this book during the school year and kids can uh, read the rest over the summer if they want to um I don't know if you know that this is actually two books. Little Women was the first one. And then the second half of the book, part two, is called Good Wives. And so um, the reason I love this book is, gosh, so many reasons that I love this book. Honestly, I, I identify with this mother so much. Um, when my kids were growing up and, and I had to make a decision about raising them or you know 
hard things happen. It's like, gosh, how do we handle this? And I would often think about Marmy. It's like, oh, what would Marmy say <laughs> if, if she had this issue? And of course, I also totally related to Joe. She's such a tomboy and um and so uh out of step, I guess. <laughs> out of step with other young ladies of the time um and so yeah there's just there's so much in here to love um one thing that your kids might really enjoy about this book if they read pilgrim's progress is that a lot of the chapter titles mimic pilgrim's progress um and they talk about playing Pilgrim's Progress. So that's um, that's a, a literary illusion that your kids will be able to appreciate if they've read that already. Um, <clears throat> Shakespeare this year, King Lear, As You Like It, and Julius Caesar. Those are the three plays that we're doing. Um, Julius Caesar, again, in the third term because we wanted them to finish the Plutarch life first um for pe they will be learning skills that have to do with soccer basketball and horseshoes this year and for our historical dance which is from seventh grade up we um we try to integrate um, not only dances from the time period, but we do them with music from the time period, and we try to include um, several cultures um, in the dance. And so the first one that we're going to do is the flamenco, which is Spanish, and then we'll do the Virginia Reel, which if you ever watch a movie <laughs> that's set during this time period and there's a ball they're probably going to do the virginia reel so that one is scotch irish and then uh, in term three they're going to do a dance that was very popular on slave plantations called the cakewalk um, and that was when um, they had competitions with dancing and the the winner won a cake um, so that's our our PE. And then in science, um, with nature lore, we read Ernest Thompson Seton's Wild Animals I Have Known. Um, it's it's a, a heavy book if you have an animal lover. I'll just go ahead and prepare you. Um, my daughter likes to call this book Wild Animals That All Died. <laughs> Uh, but it's really, uh, like Ernest Seton Thompson, Ernest Thompson Seton, sorry, he has really watched, um, animals and knows their behavior. And I, I just think these stories are fascinating, like almost getting into the mind of a wild animal, um, it, it, they are fascinating stories. My my favorite one in here is about the crow that keeps stealing shiny things. Um, anyway, that's the nature lore. Um, students in seventh and eighth grade start physical science studies, um, but they do it through uh, a historical walk through scientific discoveries. So. Um, in seventh grade, we do the Joy Hakem book, um, Aristotle Leads the Way. So sort of what the ancients thought about um, physical science. Um, and then in eighth grade, they move to Newtonian science. So that's as far as we get. There is a third book in this series that's optional for ninth graders that's about Einstein. But um, Newtonian physics is is probably about as far as we would need to go by eighth grade anyway. Um, but I really like I like these books for the historical. I mean, the science in them is current and it's 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 really well written. But um, but the history just 
I don't know, studying the history of math and the history of science is really fascinating to me and to a lot of kids. Um, but you know, Mason had a mindset about science that she really wanted kids to cultivate. Um, and that is that you need to stay apprised of what's happening in science, but you need to hold those things loosely because a new discovery could come along later that upends everything that you thought you knew. These books do a great job of telling those stories. It was like, at this point in time, this is what people knew and they knew it, like they knew they knew it. And then a new discovery came along and showed that they were wrong. And so it had to be reworked. And so they, they believed this for a period of time. And then a new discovery came along and, and they had to tear down their house. So um, if nothing else, if kids didn't get anything else from these books, I think humility when it comes to science, like knowing the what the science is, but staying humble about what you think you know, um, because you view science as an ongoing revelation of God. So you know, think people will continue to discover things that will challenge um, the set of beliefs that the scientific community has today. If nothing else, that is gold that comes from these books. So, um, so I really like those. And then uh, they also do a book per term on just general science topics. So this is a biography um, about Maria Marion uh, and she was an artist, but her art actually um, taught scientists about insects. And so that was a, an interesting um, sort of twist on things. She's out there in nature observing and drawing um, like just like you do. You go outside and you, you draw things. And when you observe closely enough, you discover things that maybe other people haven't discovered. And so that's what this is. Um, there's a book on medical breakthroughs. Um, there's a book on plate tectonics. Uh, let's see. There is a book on diseases, one on DNA and one on architecture that are done in seventh and eighth grade. So, um, that is a quick walk through form three. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're as excited about your books as I am, and I hope your kids enjoyed them as much as I did. Thanks.